if you guys can all accept that pain, injury, setbacks are going to happen in your training life, then the process is much easier to go about handling them, right? Because um, I think a lot of times we put this narrative around exercise as having a preventative effect to those things, but I don't think you can necessarily prevent them. You can mitigate them. You can bring down the level of those things possibly happening through proper training protocols and uh, just your, uh, general, again, general education on the topic. But again, we can't prevent them necessarily. And when we do, more importantly is more than just preventing or mitigating or whatnot, how do we respond to these things when it happens? Like Jess was just talking about fear mongering, or not, let's say fear avoidance, catastrophizing, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, behaviors that don't, or just not conducive to get you back into regular training, all right? So we need to learn how to respond appropriately. From there, we all know, like I just talked about, good training um, is gonna incrementally expose you to more and more stress to make you hit more PRs, and those PRs could be on the barbell, uh, with how hard you have to work during a mile run, um, how much body fat you lose, uh, how much musculature you gain onto your skeleton, whatever it may be, whatever your goal is, um, we have to impose more and more stress, and that comes with possible risk, and possible risk of a pain experience or an injury, or whatever it may be. All right, guys, from there, all right, so, we're gonna talk about two behaviors that are typically exhibited by an individual who's going through a pain experience, all right? And those two um, behaviors are fear avoidance and catastrophizing, like Jess mentioned in, the previous, in her previous presentation. Um, fear avoidance, basically all that is, it explains why the individual is, after their pain experience, avoiding functional tasks, movements, and exercise, and this can be further um, defined as kinesophobia, like we have in the cup over here. Kinesophobia is just when you're afraid to do stuff that's normal, like normal movements, all right? So sitting to a chair, standing up, uh, picking up a deadlift bar, because all of that is normal human movement. Now, we add weight to it and make it, I guess you could say, unnormal. I don't, I don't, it's, still, it's still normal though, all right? Maybe, but it's kind of relative, all right? From there, we have catastrophizing. So that's when you have the pain and you kind of mull over that pain and you you think about it all the time, which has a magnification effect, all right? Maybe that pain started off small, and through your brain, you've started to just focus on that pain, and, it, and research shows that this may have a, an effect from that, like Jess was saying, acute versus chronic. So that pain might have started acutely, and maybe we could have squashed it, maybe we could have nipped it in the bud very quickly, but now, since you've made a mountain out of a molehill, now it's crossed into that chronic pain level to where you have to deal, deal with this thing for a long time, whether or not you've healed from said trauma or whether there was trauma there to begin with. Does that make sense? Like tissue trauma. All right, so move on. Again, I want to hammer home. I think repetition is good. I know this is a big word, bio, psycho, social, but if we break it apart, all it is is bio, psych, and then social. All right, so what does that mean? Bio, we're talking about the tissue, okay? so specific things that happen to the tissue. Psycho, psychosocial, we're talking about your past experience, uh, your current education level, your thoughts and beliefs uh, through your education on the topic, and then the social, and this is a big one, social gets, gets me fired up. Uh, it's what you see constantly on your social media page in relation to pain here, or what other people are telling you about your pain, whether or not they have a good amount of education on the subject or not. You're learning that information, you're taking that in, and hopefully this will help you get a better understanding and deciding what you should do about it. Um, I'm gonna jump in just for a second to clarify a little bit on the social. Social is also how it's affecting your social life. Sure. And that for us, that's huge, right? CrossFit is all about <laughs> fitness. That's a huge part of my social life. Um, but even outside of here, how it's affecting, is it, are you staying home all the time because you can't sit in a car to go out with your friends or things like that? 100%, agree. Okay, so. Next, before we attack these two things, or in fact, these two examples, I just want to give an, uh, a literature definition of what an injury is, all right? So it's, I think it's good to define our terms, and I'll show you quickly that it becomes hard to understand a definition, even if it is defined. So the definition of injury is a recordable health-related incident in athletics is defined as any physical or psychological complaint or manifestation experienced by an athlete irrespective, so I mean, if they visited, irrespective of the need of medical attention, 
or time lost from athletic activity, so if they visited the doctor or not. Um, this definition is a mouthful and I put it on there because I think it does not do a good job of defining an injury and I don't think anybody has very black and whitely defined an injury. I think if you think about injury, it exists more on a, on a spectrum from severe injury to less severe. Okay, and the biopsychosocial model helps us explain those injuries and the constituent parts that feed into the pain experienced from said injury. All right. So we have two stark examples. So we have a traumatic injury, which I'm going to characterize with just a compound fracture. So a bone physically sticking from your skin that you have <laughs> broken from falling off something. You know, like, that's a very you know, powerful image. Rick Rohn. Oh yeah, Rick off of a box. Turned off of a box. <laughs> he broke his ankle. That it that's happens. a real. It happens here. Tissue trauma. Okay. Real so. Thing. If we look at that pain experience from a compound fracture, there is a huge biological input in that because of the bone that is sticking and protruding from your skin. Then, secondarily to that, we have a psychological aspect. You're probably freaking out about what's happening to you right now, so that's adding to your pain. And then, maybe smaller, it, it, and these can all change, this isn't set, but you have the social aspect. Who, what's, who's around you, and how, do, how are they reacting to what just happened to you, okay? then. To contrast that, we have an idiopathic injury. All the idiopathy means is that, like Jess said, there's really no causative agent to underlying pathology of your injury. So, like, there's no, there may be, there may or may not be visible tissue damage under an MRI or an x ray or whatnot, but you're still experiencing pain. And what we're going to equate that to is maybe just a back tweak during training, all right? So, maybe during a, like a heavy deadlift, okay? So, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and we're kind of highlighting back pain a lot here, but these are overarching principles that you can take to most injuries in the gym. It's just, it's just easy. Back pain is a very easy target. Yeah. To, How many people in here have experienced back pain? You know what I'm saying? Right. Their training. It's everybody. You know, it's <laughs> crazy. Anyway, from there, just the stark difference is the biological input from a back tweak may be relatively small. I'm not saying it's not there, but it just may be not the driving factor in your pain experience. Secondarily to that, we have the social. So like, again, what have you seen on your social media page that influences your ideas about what a back tweak means? Um, what are other people in the gym saying? Oh, I've experienced that as well. This is my experience, but it's not your experience, right? And then finally, the biggest portion is gonna be the psychological like if you've experienced back pain before, you know it sucked before, it's gonna be, you know, you might feel like it's gonna be hard to get out of, it's gonna be hard to come back to training and all that. So hopefully through this, you can have some requisite steps on how to hasten that process to come back to training. So again, I won't spend too much time on these, but I just like these two studies because they're specifically applicable to this CrossFit gym and what we do here. And it just kind of reaffirms the idea that exercise is one of the drivers that can help you return to a pain-free existence. Not that pain-free existence should be your goal, but anyway, pain-free existence. So the first study, we're just looking at free rate training, which is what we do here. Free weights, uh, squatting, deadlifting, uh, benching, kettlebells, you name it. Uh, but that's <coughs> ability to help individuals, individuals with chronic low back pain return to a more symptom-free life. And then secondarily, there's basically the same things going on, but this one looked at group exercise, which is again, what we do here. We do group exercise with free weights. And it's modification on helping low back pain symptoms. Um, and again, here's some examples of the exercises used. We, in this one we have again, we got goblet squats, split squat, plank, deadlift, all the things we typically see in here. And then here we have core training, bending and lifting, that's deadlifting and things like that. Um, the big takeaway point from both of these studies, they both help people over a 70% margin of all the participants in the study, but that before the exercise intervention was implemented, they had a robust talk about education towards pain, and then they really wanted to suss out what people thought about their pain, where their pain was coming from, and they gave them a lot of practical examples, a lot of literature like we're giving you now to reassure them that it's okay to exercise even if there is some residual pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. So from there, we'll go into the model. And this is the how to, the overarching principles that we like to use or that me and Jess have uh, thought about. And again, this is not, so I just want to preface, this is not my model, but it's tweaked to help fix things in this specific context within the CrossFit gym. 
Cool. So in this model, which was first pr proposed by Dos uh, Dr. Austin Baraki of Barbell Medicine, if you guys aren't familiar with Barbell Medicine, they're a great, I don't know, they, their pain science stuff is awesome. But from here, so we have a four compartment model. Uh, the first model we've already been through, uh, which is the education course, and Jess provided you robust information with that. And then hopefully this has provided you uh, with some reassurance should you encounter some kind of pain experience with uh, your training life that we can move past that and exercise will help bring those levels down. From there, we'll talk about load management, like Jess uh, indicated in hers. Um, and basically all load management is, is there any way or any weight that we can use with whatever exercise it might be to where you can still complete the exercise. So if it's a deadlift, can I pick up a deadlift bar with just the deadlift bar, right? Can I do that? And how high can I go in a weight to where that's okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right on. So, where was I going with that? If there's not a load that you can do that with, then we're going to shift to range of motion. Range of motion is just going to be, again, with the deadlift example, is it okay for me to deadlift literally from a thigh height to here, right? With the, it doesn't matter what kind of weight, but can we progress it from there? From there, can we go a little bit lower, maybe next week? And then finally, can we go from the floor and finish that deadlift? Does that make sense? And then finally from there, if none of these strategies work, if load management didn't work, if range of motion didn't work, can we change the exercise selection enough that still mimics that same, the, the deadlift that we're trying to do, so maybe like a sumo deadlift or um, whatever it may be to get you back to conventional deadlifting. Cool? Mm -hmm. and, and, and also I want to preface that we wanted to make you guys think, because I think a lot of times when we go to like a, uh, a clinician and they prescribe us quote-unquote uh, rehab, rehab exercises that the main movement can be the rehab exercise and we're not telling you not to do extra rehab exercise but this should be the meat and potatoes you should try to come back from a deadlift injury with a deadlift if you can that'd be the good that'd be the best if it's your goal to go back to because that's going to help fight your fear avoidance it's going to help fight your catastrophizing um, that does not at all mean that you don't do your rehab prescribed by your doctor but you do it in addition to Stuff in the gym, and we and he's going to keep going through some rules on how to manage those, yes. adding that that scary exercise back. So specifically, we're just going to look at load management. Uh, we'll do a quick demo out there of range of motion and exercise selection. But specifically, load management is the tangible thing that we can touch, that we can change within the gym immediately to help alleviate some of these symptoms. So. We're going to look at external and internal measures. So all that means is external measures are things that we can quantify, things that I can type into a calculator and or things I can plot on a chart that I can measure. So that might be weight on the bar. That might be volume associated with an exercise. That might be the tonnage associated with an exercise. So tonnage is just how much total weight did I lift over that volume, right? From, from there, we can measure distance ran, uh, how far do we row, how far do we bike. We do that on a daily basis. And then we can also measure the duration of the workout. Was that workout 15 minutes? Was it 30 minutes? Was it two minutes? All those things. From there, we move on to the more things that we want to talk about, which are the internal measures. So these are the things that only you know uh, how you feel during that exercise, all right? And we're going to characterize these by three separate things. We're going to talk about rating of perceived exertion, which is RPE. I'm sorry, this is, <laughs> but I think I've talked about RPE before. I don't know, I've kind of mentioned it here and there in class. But RPE, it, all it means is how hard was that individual exercise on a scale of 1 to 10. All right, 1 being the easiest thing you've ever done, 10 being a maximal effort, okay? From there, we're going to talk session RPE. Session RPE is very similar to RPE. Session RPE is going to be the cumulative effect of the hour you spend here at CrossFit O'Fallon. How hard was that hour in total? Right? Does that make sense? Again, one being the easiest thing you've ever done, 10 being a maximal effort. From there, we'll talk about reps and reserve. So reps and reserve can be used in conjunction with RPE. So if I did a set of five on a back squat and I rated it at an RPE seven and the back squat was, I don't know, for Shane, it was 295. Okay, he did 295 for five reps and it was an RPE seven. Reps and reserve would tell me he could have done three more reps before he reached a failure point, all right? Does that make sense? Just give you some context. And then finally, I'm not going to spend too much time on acute chronic workload ratio. This is an overarching principle that just says we don't want to impose too much stress onto the body that we're not currently or have been in the recent history used to, if that makes sense. 
how I can explain this a little better is the sunburn example. So if you want to be, you know, bronze in the summertime and get a good tan, right? So you're going to do your due diligence. You're going to go outside and maybe you'll start if you're a fair-skinned individual like me and you burn it easy. Uh, you'll go outside and maybe tan for 15 minutes and hopefully that'll get you a little bit tanner. And you might repeat that process for the next couple of days. Maybe you'll increase the time a little bit, maybe like five minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. But what happens if one day you fell asleep out there and now you've imposed an hour of sun exposure and stress onto your skin? It's gonna burn. It's a very similar physiological process uh, as training, right? We've just imposed too much stimulus and now we've exhibited a pain response. Make sense? Okay, so RP and SRB, how do we use these things and which numbers are useful in the training arena? So when you come in, you're always using RP, whether you realize it or not, whether there's a percentage on the board or not, or there's a prescribed weight that we want you to use. So say you came in and you had it in your head that you were in a squat 265 that day, and you're going to do it for your set of five on your last set of five during the strength workout in the, in the gym. So you get in and you throw 185 on the bar, and you're like, damn, that was heavy. So in your head, you're already thinking maybe 265, is not a great idea today, so I'm going to scale back the weight. So you just use RPE, and whether you knew it or not, maybe now you have the context, but you just did, you brought the weight back down. Hopefully we're making that choice, we're not just pushing through. Yeah, so hopefully we're not making that choice, we're just, yes, anyway. So um, RPE allows us <coughs> to gauge a proper stimulus when we come in for exercise, right? So I think a lot of times we get caught up chasing numbers on a bar, and we're less concerned with chasing the stimulus that the numbers cause, if that makes sense, okay? So when you do a back squat, your, your body recognizes the stimulus of the weight, not the weight on the bar. Your brain knows how much weight's on there, but sometimes, depending on the day, if you're stressed out, again, if your cup is almost full, you know what I'm saying, maybe if you're gonna squat that 265, the 225 was enough to meet your stimulus goal, all right? And that's okay, and you're still, deriving a good amount of training stress to further your strength gain or whatever it may be. Okay, and all of these RPs, if you want a chart, I can give you it. They all correspond with the percentage. If you're a percentage person, you like percentages, they can be used in conjunction with each other. Okay, so if we look at the scale from zero to 10, so from a zero to five RPE, this is not gonna be enough stimulus. These are your warm-up sets, getting yourself to the the sweet spots of training within the RP, which is gonna be a six to eight. So in a six to eight, that's when you've imposed enough stress to cause your body to make an adaptation to make you better. Does that make sense? And that, that adaptation could be anything. It could be you know, strength gain, it can be cardiovascular gain, you, you name it, but it can be any one of those. From there, we have a nine. So nines are when you've made an effort, and if we use that reps in reserve conjunction, okay, we have one rep left in the tank. That was super heavy, and I think I could have done one more, but maybe not. These are more reserved for when you're going further in your training, you might be getting closer to a uh, competition type setting. Does that make sense? All right, so we want to reserve those. Then, finally, a 10 is reserved only for testing your competition. I always say that <laughs> The paid and laid example. So, if you're going to get paid for that effort, or you're going to attract the the, uh, the opposite sex, you know, or I mean, whoever you like, doesn't matter. Um, then that's when it's time to go. I think a lot of times, especially in here, we get too focused on, especially on a daily basis, going to that ten level. And when you go to that ten level, again, we can invite the sunburn upon ourselves. All right, it, especially if it's done too frequently. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Okay, now, so we have our practical example. So we're gonna go out there real quick. Jess is gonna be the demo, and we're just gonna go through if Jess exhibited a lower back tweak like three to five days ago, and now she's come back to class, she wants to work out because she's had all this education from her coach, and, or whoever it may be, and now she feels better about exercise, and we're gonna try to keep her moving within a group set. Cool? I still see that real quick. Uh, I want, two things. One, we talked about RPE as a scale, but I also want to talk about pain scale. There isn't a set research point, really. Um, it's kind of how you are. Um, I based my personal advice against uh, Greg Lehman, who's someone I respect a great deal. He has the same one as me. Um, but anyway, you only want to go up two pain points at any given time. 
So if you rate your pain on a scale of one to 10, 10 take you to the freaking hospital right now. One is uh, what pain? I don't have any pain. Um, if you're at a three and you're working out, maybe push it to a five, don't go past that because that's maybe too much pain. And then gauge that pain throughout the rest of the day and into tomorrow. If that pain goes back down to a three, perfect. If it stays at a five, maybe, maybe don't do so much in the gym. Maybe you pushed it too far. Maybe you only go up one pain point. Does that make sense? So kind of on the same aspect of Jake's RPE scale and talking about like the load um, and how well you're doing the movement, that stimulus, it's almost talking about quantity versus quality, right? We want more quality over than just loading quantity. Same as with your pain right there is like we don't want the quantity of pain. We want to stay in that quality of movement to manage whatever we have going on, right? I'll let Jake handle that one. So, <laughs> Sorry, I was listening, but you're talking, you're talking RP, and so yeah. like you gave right. the example of if you want to hit that two, uh, sorry, that's what my face was. Yeah. Uh, if you want to hit that two sixty five squat, yes. but two twenty five is like at eight. Yes. Uh, so we want to maintain the quality of movement instead of going to the quantity that's going to overload our cuff. So, I agree that if it, if the two twenty five was an RP eight, that maybe that was enough stimulus for that day, depending on where you are. In your training schedule. I think where we have to be careful is do you mean quality of movement within a technique aspect and te technical breakdown? Uh, we can go there, yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So within, say, okay, we're gonna go back to the deadlift example because it's easy. So a lot of the times people attribute their lower back tweak or whatnot um, to erroneous deadlift techniques. So maybe they rounded their back. All right, um, there's robust amounts of information, I mean, uh, evidence to say that during any exercise, there is a certain degree of spinal flexion. So that means, you know, the cat back, okay? Um, within that, we want to talk about spinal neutrality. So we all know that we're trying to keep our spine neutral and we're trying to hold it in place and that will protect us. Well, there's always going to be a degree, this is nuance, there's always going to be a degree of spinal flexion and Technique should be viewed, at least in my opinion, I think the research would back me that, that it is more used for efficiency of movement and less used as a protective mechanism. Because all right, have you said, everyone's seen everyone pull a max deadlift? Is their back flat more often than not? No, it's not, you know what I mean? And this plays into, during that back flexion, what did your previous training history look like? Were you really pushing it for a long time and were you ready to absorb that maximal weight during the erroneous deadlift technique? I mean, are you guys following? Yes. Does that make so, sense? So just because you're backgrounded doesn't mean you're going to get injured. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's not. Yeah, so, it's, it's, not, it's not at all an excuse to have crappy technique. No, We need to work on that every not. time, but um, we want to build our cup big enough to be able to absorb when we do push to a 10 and we can have that crappy technique. Um, we want to we want to be able all tissue has limitations. We just want to build the cup big enough that when we when we get to that bad tech bad technique, uh, we can absorb that. Um, Has you ever seen like a strong man lift a stone? No. Or that's how, that's, uh, that, that is the technique. Oh, yeah. Full spinal flexion, flexion and they roll it up. And it's a it's a that's max <laughs> max volitional effort. So it packs all the muscle you can put into that stone. If it is a max stone, it's all the effort and. And that's what I was say. Yeah. Also, you can have perfect technique and still. Yes, that's good really point, really Rick. Yeah, dude, people so, who have perfect so technique all get injured. Yeah. Did you push it because your your back was too flexed, or did you push it because you were too tired and your tissue hadn't been resting enough? Your cup was too full. So that quality still is limited by that individual. Same as RP. RP, like I can't tell you what your RP is, and I, tell, I can't really tell you what your quality of movement is, except for sure. like while you're doing it. Yeah, and I think the takeaway point is like. Don't be hyper vigilant, especially if you're experiencing pain. And even if you're not, don't be hyper vigilant on like holding a quote unquote perfect standard of technique because there's going to be technical breakdown once you get tired. You know, so and it's it's more often than not just your ability again with RP to manage the kind of weight you're using to help mitigate again, not prevent, mitigate those pain experiences from happening during exercise. Any other questions before we head out to go over some of these like some practical examples of what this might be? Because our goal here, we are still your coaches and we want to help guide you through this when, yes. you're, in, when you're in here, but we want you guys to be empowered to, to make some choices yourself and to feel comfortable asking and kind of just know what to expect from us.